Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Council of Townships of North Dundas, today being January 18, 2023. Moved by, Councilor, moved by Deputy Mayor Berzon, seconded by Councilor Annabelle, that the meeting of the Council of the Corporation of the Township of North Dundas be hereby called to order at 7.01 p.m. All those in favor? Opposed to the amendments carried. Moved by Councilor Annabelle, seconded by Councilor Yurid, that Council adopt the agenda as presented. All those in favor? Opposed, seeing none. It's good. Moved by Councilor Yurid, seconded by Councilor Annabelle, that the minutes of the regular meeting of the Council of the Township of North Dundas, held October 11, 2022, be adopted as presented. All those in favor? Opposed, seeing none. It's good. Is there any disclosures of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof? Seeing none. Moved by Councilor Annabelle, seconded by Councilor Ray, that the minutes of the public meeting held on December 6, 2022, be adopted as presented. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. That's carried. Moved by Councilor Yurig, seconded by Councilor Annabelle, that the minutes of the regular meeting of the Council of the Township of North Dundas held on December 6, 2022, be adopted as presented. All those in favor? Opposed, seeing none, that's carried. Moved by Councilor Annabel, seconded by Councilor Yurig, that the minutes of the special meeting of the Council of the Township of North Dundas held on December 14, 2022, be adopted as presented. All those in favor? Opposed, seeing none. That's carried. Moved by Councilor Yurig, seconded by Councilor Annabelle, that the minutes of the special meeting of the Council of the Township of North Dundas held on December 20th, 2022, be adopted as presented. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Okay. Moved by Councilor Annabelle, seconded by Councilor Yurig, that the minutes of the regular meeting of the Council of the Township of North Dundas held on December 20th, 2022, the adopted as presented. All those in favor? Opposed? The amendment's carried. We're almost there. Moved by Councilor Yurig, second by Councilor Hannibal, that the minutes of the public meeting of the Council of the Township of North Dundas held on December 20th, 2022, be adopted as presented. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. That's carried. And at this point, we're going to move into delegations. And tonight we have with us, virtually, is Jacob Hanlon to speak about the Food Cycle from the Food Cycle Science Corporation. Welcome, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, uh, Mayor and members of Council and staff. Um, would it be all right if I shared my screen over here as well? Yes, that'll be fine, thank you. Okay. Okay, can you confirm you can see my screen? We can see it fine, thank you. Perfect, thank you. So I just wanna start by saying thank you uh, for having me on tonight to present to you. Um, I'm the Municipal Program Coordinator at Food Cycle Science, and I'm here to discuss a food waste program uh, opportunity for your community. So just to give a, a little bit about our company here. So Food Cycle Science is a Canadian company based out of Ottawa. And we're 100% focused on food waste diversion solutions. So 
we do this using our innovative technology called the Food Cycler. And it's an in-home food recycler, which is sold directly to consumers through partners like Vitamix and Breville. Um, they go into classrooms through partnerships with our not-for-profit organizations and uh, Eco Schools Canada. And then two municipalities through our Food Cycler Municipal Solutions Division. So our many small, um, sorry, our municipal solutions, they help many small uh, rural, remote and Northern communities keep food waste out of their landfills. Uh, we're currently working with 44 Canadian municipalities across seven provinces and territories uh, from Nelson in British Columbia up to Hay River in the Northwest Territories. And then several communities here in Ontario uh, who often face struggles with food waste management or where green bins aren't the best option for them. Uh, and then nearby to you, we have uh, South Glengarry, South Stormont, and uh, South Dundas who have programs with us. So just to start talking about the problem a little here, the problem with food waste is that it is avoidable. Uh, it accounts for a large portion of our household waste, often a majority, and it's made up of mostly liquid, which is heavy and freezes in the winter time. On top of that, food waste in landfills is responsible for generating harmful greenhouse gases. And so all these factors make it so that food waste is a problem that has a strong impact on municipalities. So one of the impacts to municipalities is that since food waste makes up such a large portion of our waste stream, it's causing our landfills to fill up quickly. Uh, operating a landfill is costly for a municipality, so we want to extend the lifespan of our landfills for as long as possible. The environmental impact is that organic waste in landfills produces methane gas, which is many times more harmful than CO2. And to put that into perspective, taking one ton of food waste out of the waste stream is the equivalent to taking a car off the road for an entire year. In our communities, putting food waste in the garbage causes some unwanted odors, uh, which is unpleasant for humans, but uh, it often attracts animals such as raccoons and bears who like to go through our trash. Uh, by removing food waste from the garbage, it eliminates these issues. And more importantly, it reduces the volume of the garbage that ends up going to the landfill. So this can save on hauling and disposal fees. Uh, it can save space within the landfill and residents can save on any hassle and any excess waste fees that they may face. So we often get asked the question, haven't we solved this already? And there are green bins, which are common in big cities with high population densities and with the right infrastructure. Uh, however, this can be cost prohibitive or operationally challenging to implement. And many people in your community might back air compost, and we think this is a great solution, but unfortunately back air composting, it's not feasible for everyone. Uh, it's certainly not a year round solution, and there's still the concern about bears and other animals. So, and then finally, it's the easiest solution is to continue to landfill your organic waste, but the long-term impacts here are costly and harmful to the environment. So at Food Cycler, we proposed a different way to deal with our food waste. And this really focuses on making food waste very easy to deal with and with a great user experience. So essentially we've built a small kitchen appliance about the size of a bread machine where you can put in your food waste, which includes meat, poultry, fish, and even some bones. And then in a matter of hours, you have a nutrient rich soil amendment. And what you've done is you've essentially recycled the food waste into a sterile state and you've reduced the weight and the volume of it by approximately 90%. So the food cycler will process on average one kilogram of food waste per cycle. Each cycle takes between four and eight hours to complete and it uses less than one kilowatt hour of power. So typically a couple cents per cycle. The result is about 100 grams of dry, sterile, and odorless soil amendment that you can add to your plants, to your garden, or to your lawn. The machine can be used anywhere that has a plug, and most people store it in their kitchen or in their basement or even in a heated garage. From an environmental standpoint, the food cycle is comparable to backyard and central composting, uh, but with central composting, it's not taking into account any transportation emissions. Um, it represents an approximate reduction of greenhouse gas impacts by about 95% compared to sending food waste to the landfill. In terms of an economic impact, our solution offers a return on investments by significantly reducing your waste management costs. And you're looking at savings of upwards of $150 per ton versus traditional methods that would involve hauling and disposal fees. So one thing we've learned from working with our municipalities is that 
residents are very interested in being part of the solution. They want to try new things, they want options, and they want their municipal governments to bring these things to their communities. With the food cycler, you get to bring something innovative and tangible to your residents, and they don't need to live in a big city to be able to divert their organics. We believe food waste should be available to all Canadians uh, to have the options to divert no matter where they live. And then on top of this kind of social pressure as well are the impacts of the regulations that are coming to us here in Ontario. Uh, there are a number of diversion targets that I'm sure you know are coming to effect in the next couple of years. So with the food cycler, what we're doing is we're reducing waste at the source and we're focusing on that low hanging fruit as we like to say, because since food waste accounts for such a large portion of household waste, it's the single most impactful strategy to achieving these new diversion targets. So I mentioned earlier, we're working with several municipalities across Canada. Uh, to date, we've completed pilot programs in over 40 municipalities and over 4,700 households. And the results have been overwhelmingly positive. We're able to achieve a significant amount of net new waste diversion. Uh, there's a generous user experience rating of 4.6 out of five stars and a 98% participation rate for those who have signed on to these programs. Many municipalities have expanded their programs to more households within their community after the initial pilot program. Uh, in Nelson, British Columbia, for example, after two successful pilot programs, they're putting a food cycler in every home of their city of 11,000 people. So several months ago, Food Cycler was selected as a finalist for Impact Canada's Food Waste Reduction Challenge, which is a three-part initiative from the government of Canada to reduce Canada's food waste. As a finalist, we were awarded with $400,000 uh, and tasked with finding more Canadian municipalities as implementation partners. We're using this funding to invest directly into pilot projects at a heavily subsidized price. So these pilots will help us move into the final stage of the challenge, which comes with a $1.5 million grand prize and any future funding received will continue to be used to invest into these programs for Canadians and any municipalities that partner with us will have the right of first refusal on sub subsequent funding. Now just to give a brief kind of run through of what the pilot program looks like, it's typically a 12 week project. Residents purchase a food cycler at a subsidized rate from their municipality and they use the unit and track the number of cycles per week. At the end, the residents get to keep their food cycler and we just ask them to complete a brief survey so that we can evaluate the program's success. The results are presented back to you in a final report or a feasibility study, um, if you will. And this data, it can then be used to support your future waste management decision-making or to accompany a recommendation or a grant application to expand the program. And we offer final report and grant writing uh, support as part of the cost of the pilot program. So funded pilot programs are available and, and we here we have some size recommendations. So for a municipality of your size, uh, we would recommend the 100 household pilot program. The funded pilots work based on a subsidy model and I'll kind of just give a little breakdown here in the diagram on the left. Um, food cycle science provides a discount and then we add in the federal investment from Impact Canada which then gets the price of the unit reduced by 50%. We then ask the municipality to subsidize the cost by $100 per unit plus shipping. So then the resident only ends up paying $150 for a $500 machine. And then after the 12 week pilot, the food cycler is theirs to keep. And I'd like to highlight that these are merely recommendations based on experience. Um, I know with the three Celts right near you, two of them went with 100 unit household pilots and uh, the other one uh, went with 200 units. So we can explore other program sizes and, and kind of tailor everything that fit your needs or your budget. And the Impact Canada funding period for these programs does close in April of this year or until the funding is, uh, is fully allocated, whichever comes sooner. So we'd like to welcome your community as a partner in this food waste challenge, as we believe that your community is a great fit for the benefits of the program. Uh, today, we just kindly ask that you receive our presentation as information and should there be any interest in partnering with us on a funded pilot program, uh, we ask that you refer this to staff for a report and a recommendation. And I'd just like to kindly say thank you so much for allowing me to present tonight. And uh, I'm prepared to answer any questions you may have at this time. Well, thank you, Mr. Hammond, uh, for the presentation. Uh, it truly really is an interesting concept. Uh, and, um, and you did mention the the other ways that people would compost 
and I think of the challenges presented to us by some of uh, our residents that we find better ways to manage the waste in our community and some of the things that they've talked about. But uh, the scale uh, on those larger programs, I, I don't think we have, uh, we have the uh, capability to, to uh, meet the requirements of those larger scale projects. So this is a smaller scale. And um, very interesting, and I can see that there's some interest at the table to ask some questions. So I'm going to turn it over to my fellow councillors and, uh, and uh, for questions, comments for you, Mr. Allen. Thank you. Councillor Excuse me, that's a question, just more of a comment. I, uh, I did present this as a potential budget uh, item uh, this year, admittedly, um, having seen some success with it in South Dundas and have talked to some of our local municipal, uh, municipal colleagues who have undertaken the challenge and have implemented uh, these systems. Um, and to your point, Mr. Mayor, I think this is the type of uh, progressive thing that we can do in this township to minimize, even at the small scale, the uh, impact on our landfill, which we all are well aware is a challenge at the moment. Thank you, comments. Good comments. Uh, Councillor uh, Councilor Annabelle. Uh, what kind of warranty are on these machines, and where would they go for service if required? Yes. Yeah, so there, each unit comes with a one-year warranty, and. This can be tailored as well uh, within the pilot program. Uh, for, a, for a larger program, we can increase that warranty, but they come with a standard one-year warranty. And we have a fantastic customer care uh, division within our company where any uh, kind of troubleshooting that needs to be done with the residents, with their, their machines, our, our team takes care of it all. Uh, if there happens to be a replacement that's needed, we take care of uh, getting the new unit shipped out and everything. So. We're very much uh, hands-on with these pilot programs to make sure that, that everyone uh, has a good setup and has their unit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Deputy Mayor, thoughts? Or are you comfortable just to hear what's going on? Thank you. So I, I do have some questions, Mr. Hammond. Um, and, and bear with me if it's already in the presentation or if I've, uh, I didn't hear it or, or or I missed it when I was going through it. Uh, food waste, um, fats, meats, are they all, is that acceptable in the, uh, uh, to be put into the food cycle? Yes, so pretty much anything except steak bones can go in. Um, if it's something like a corn, on, a corn on the cob, we'd recommend that it gets cut up into smaller pieces. Um, but meat, dairy, uh, chicken, chicken wing bones, fish bones, Basically, any food waste can go in there apart from kind of like a T-bone, steak bone, or things like that. Um, each food cycler comes with a resident guide as well, so it's all laid out for the residents to see and, and pretty easy to follow along. And the next uh, question I have, Mr. Hammond, is uh, odor. Is there, you talk about keeping the basement in a heated garage or maybe even in the kitchen. Um, during the cycle, and I envision this being the, the, the bucket being close to the food prep area and, you know, discard the trimmings and uh, then after the meal, I guess, maybe whatever's left over could be discarded. Uh, but the odor emitted, if it's in the house, is it noticeable or how is that managed? Yeah, so there are no odors that come out of the unit. Um, there is a set of carbon filters that come inside every unit where it has uh, charcoal pellets that filter out any odors. So uh, while the unit has food food waste in it uh, while the cycle's on, and then once the cycle's over, there are no odors that uh, that come out. And then just since we're on the topic of the the carbon filters, um, we also provide uh, at an additional cost uh, extra refills and replacement filters because the uh, the carbon doesn't last forever. So uh, on average, it's every kind of three to six months that filters would need to be rechanged. Um, these are. Uh, Things that we can discuss uh, further, but we, we like to have uh, within the program options for residents to be able to get their hands on the filters as well. We want to basically make it as accessible as possible because as much as the program only goes for 12 weeks uh, with with residents having the machine for, for the rest of uh, the machine's lifetime, uh, it's important for them to have access to filters as well. So we, we make sure that we, we keep everything accessible. Okay, and uh, my... I, I think my final question, but probably not. 
Uh, does it need to be a heated garage, or uh, what would happen if it's in a, a garage that's not heated, and you, uh, you, you take the bin, the pail, to the uh, unit, and you let it run for the eight hours? Yeah, so the machine works best above freezing um, in, in ideally a heated space uh, because it's it's the unit uh, has a heating element within it uh, and the whole process of dehydrating and, and grinding. Um, I've put frozen food waste into my, my machine many times and that works great. But in terms of the actual machine, uh, just for optimum operations, it, it needs to be in a, a heated space. Well, thank you for that, and I think it's, uh, it's quite a timely presentation as we'll be gathering with our uh, fellow counselors from, uh, from uh, SDG and throughout, uh, throughout uh, the province very shortly, and uh, we'll have an opportunity to touch base with them and, uh, and, and get some, uh, some more feedback on the uh, potential uh, benefits of the machine. And so thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council. And Members of staff, appreciate you having me on tonight, and uh, take care. And at this point of the evening, we're going to move into uh, action requests, Madam CAO. Moved by Councillor Annabelle, seconded by Councillor Erling, that Council approves the hiring of Jamie Cheney as Interim Director of Transportation as per the letter of author dated November 23, 2022, and Danielle Ward as Interim Director of Environmental Services, as per author letter dated December 23, 2022. Madam CAO. Thank you very much. Good evening, Council. Uh, so you've heard the candidates that have accepted the positions. We're, we're very happy that we have internal candidates to fill both the uh, Director of Transportation and the Director of Environmental Services roles, so that is wonderful. And as we've discussed before, these are in time for the one-year period because we're undergoing the organizational review, so that gives us time to um, look at whatever comments come out of that and then move forward in the future based on the recommendations of that. So it's great they were able to promote existing employees, a, a wonderful opportunity for them, and great for us to be able to reap the benefits of their knowledge. Thank you. Questions, comments? Well, the question, all those in favor? Opposed, seeing none. Okay. And thank you very much to uh, Danny G and uh, Danielle Ward. It's appreciated. Mr. Mann, Economic Development, moved by Councilor Ewing, second by Councilor Annabelle, that Councilor approves sharing 20% of the 2023 local business expo profit to the North Dundas Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Mann. Yes, good evening, Mayor and Council. So the excellent class of Council tonight is concerning the upcoming local business expo. I'm excited to announce again that it will be coming back on April the 29th uh, this year. That's a, a Saturday event. It's been three years since we've had the event in the COVID pandemic. We're glad to see it, uh, see it back. Uh, the intent of the report tonight, let's go on and go closer, is for council to consider options on the profit sharing of the net amounts that are left over after all the expenses are paid uh, for the expo. Uh, traditionally, we have shared since Essentially, the exception of the expo, 50-50 uh, at the North and North Chamber of Commerce. It's going to partner with their, where they help out with some of the labor related to preparing for the event. Uh, it's a four-month process from now until in April when we host the event. Uh, it's just to dictate the significant amount of the work. Uh, it was done by uh, township staff, 80% uh, or more. It was done by myself and, uh, and colleagues here. As well, on the week of the event, sleeping in amount of time we spent after hours, first set up and all day on the Saturday with recreation staff and office staff as well. Um, so I've laid out uh, two different options for council to consider. And uh, yeah, are there any questions uh, you may have? Any questions, comments from members of council? Councilor Annabelle? Oh, um, I'm 
assume a, there has already been a, a meeting with the chamber. Yes, yes, they're involved in the place. So if they're aware of the percentages. They're aware of that uh, we're currently do 50 50, um, but they're aware that we uh, in a position of not looking to share any profits with them, but we want to bring it forth to council for, for your opinion, obviously, before we make it official. No, I just think based on the information shared in the, uh, I mean, I was, I was on the table executive when this was all kind of first banded about in the earlier years, and it was, the intent was to be kind of a split partnership, 50-50, you know, and it seemed in the first couple of years that was the case. Now it seems, for whatever reason, there's less and less interest on the chamber's part to be I don't know, helpful and set up and helpful and kind of organizing this. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, at this rate, 20% is, is probably generous. And, you know, if there's uh, interest in going back to the 50-50 model next year or in the years to come, mm -hmm. then I think there needs to be um, a little more input on the Chamber's part. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, to me, it seems like a natural, should be a natural partnership. We both want the same thing for our business community, but if, if it ends up being a, uh, a, an entire township project, then, yeah, I completely, I support the 20%. Okay, thank you, thank you, Thomas Sherman. Um, there's nothing further, we've all heard the question of Wilson Taylor. 20%. All those opposed, seeing none, that's carried. We're going to move right over to fire, but uh, before I go any further with the, uh, the resolution, I have comments from my fire, st uh, fire st uh, excuse me, I have comments from my fire commissioner who is unable to be here with us tonight, but he's asked me to read it and uh, read it to the uh, to the public. So. Um, Comments uh, for the fire liaison and uh, the deputy chief at State Chief Lee. Um, the first one is about Chief Raymond Sear. Chief Raymond Sear, I would like to, this is from uh, Councilor Lennox, the fire commissioner, I would like to personally state that I am thankful for you putting your name forward and voted in by the fire steering committee for the fire liaison position. The fire liaison position is a position that most of the public are unaware of. However, it carries with it a massive responsibility to ensure that the priorities of council, the CAO, in the township are communicated and are execu executed effectively within the North Dundas Fire Services. You will be expected to provide information updates on the many aspects of our emergency services, such as the progress of the key initiatives, input on bylaw creation or enforcement, and communicate policy changes to the four North Dundas Fire Stations. You have a demonstrated history of excellent leadership qualities and a strong dedication to serving your community. I am confident that you will succeed in this position and I'm excited to see the fresh perspectives that you will bring as a fire liaison. liaison. To Chief Mike Gillitz, thank you for your years of service as the fire liaison. As I alluded to above, this is often a generally unknown and thankless position. However, on behalf of the North End Mass Fire Services, I'd like to express my gratitude for your service in tackling many of the challenges faced by our fire services in Township. I move on. Deputy Chief Craig Reistick, this with this promotion comes a new title, but with double the responsibility, you will be held to a higher degree of accountability to support and enact policy changes from the township as well as the management of personnel, assets, and resources within your station. You will have to strike a delicate balance between being a senior leader in Station 3 while promoting a positive and safe work environment. The objective of the, objective of the fire services is to protect people, property, and the environment. I have complete faith that you will accomplish this objective with ease in your new position. Congratulations on your promotion. Thank you, Fire Commissioner slash Councillor John Lennox. <laughs> but I do want to uh, make a comment uh, uh, in, uh, about uh, Chief Dewitt. He was the first to take on this role. It was a new uh, a role that was new to all of us in North Dundas, and I think probably uh, throughout the counties. Um, 
he developed a template of uh, making sure that the uh, that the department reports were prepared and with good information for council and the public to, uh, to have. And I do thank Chief Stewart for taking on that challenge uh, in uncharted territories, uncharted waters to do it, and he did a fine job. And uh, but I, I am also looking forward to uh, uh, Chief Sears' input and his comments. Uh, the Chief and I have spent many years together on the fire steering table, and uh, I know his passion and his dedication to the fire service will serve us well. And uh, I'm looking forward to it too, so congratulations to me, and thank you. Uh, Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Maystick uh, is replacing the uh, recently retired Deputy Chief uh, Sandy Johnson. Sandy served us well in North Dundas, and especially uh, at Station 3. And uh, I, I, I look forward to the Deputy Chief Maystick's success and his input in steering along with Chief Kelly at Station 3. The two of them working together, it's going to... Uh, it's, it's going to ensure that we continue moving forward in a positive fashion. So, congratulations to uh, Deputy Chief Lasek, and uh, I guess I'll turn it over to you, Chief. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Mayor for your speech, and I want to say hi to everybody. I'm not here to give any reports tonight as we're still in the transition of getting Mike and I working together with budget stuff and getting everything transferred over that I can work on stuff. Um, to your comments of uh, Craig Raystick becoming deputy, I'd like to welcome him into the steering committee, as well as uh, Sandy Johnson giving us 22 years of service, not just as chief, but as in the fire department. Um, not only did Sandy retire this year, uh, Tom Sloan retired with 23 years, as well as Kevin Downs. So uh, Station 3 lost three, uh, or, yeah, it is a loss. They lost three good firemen to uh, retirement, so we wish them well and thank them for their service. So, um, other than that, I have nothing, nothing right now until we do a, get in the budget. Okay, so what you're going to have to do now is sit there while we go through this then. Okay. So moved by Deputy Mayor Bergeron, said to Council Annabelle, that Council accept the steering committee's recommendations to appoint Mountain Fire Station, fire station Chief Raymond Shear to the position of Fire Department Liaison and Craig Raystick as Deputy Chief of Winchester Fire Station. All those in favor. That's carried. Thank you very much. Mr. Paul. Thank you, Mayor Fraser, members of Council. Uh, we have a, I have to hold you up <laughs> for one second. Move by Councilor Hannibal, second by Deputy Mayor Bergeron, that Council hereby accepts the zoning bylaw amendment application is completed from Atlanta, Giacomo, and directs the public meeting to be held February 7, 2023. Mr. Paul. Thank you, Mayor Fraser. Members of Council, we have an application for a zoning amendment uh, for 1277 County Road 3. Uh, they're looking to convert a dwelling into a clinic. Um, they would be allowed a clinic as a home occupation, but they do not reside at this location. Uh, they would like to convert the entire property or building uh, into a clinic for medical purposes. Uh, so this is a request uh, for rezoning to rezone this property. We're looking to schedule a public meeting at the next council meeting uh, to hear all the details on this application. Thank you. Questions, comments from Mr. Paul? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, it's carried. Ms. Ward. Moved by Councilor Annabel, second by Deputy Mayor Bergeron. The Council approved the following water and sewer allocation temporary extension request based on staff review and recommendations. Winchester Meadows development application for 28 units for two 14 unit buildings to be constructed April 2023 at 454 Lancaster Lane. 2820939 and Limited for a semi-detached home to be constructed in April 2023 at 72 Aaron Avenue in Chesterville. 
2023 at 138 Elizabeth Drive in Chesterville. And finally, wellings of Winchester Inc. for 80 senior units be constructed in 2023 at 12046 County Road 3 in Winchester. Ms. Ward. Thank you, Mayor. So, in December of 2022, Council directed staff to reach out to applicants with water allocations that were going to expire um, between January and March of 2023. Um, so, based on that direction, staff issued a letter to our um, outstanding water allocation applicants with expiry dates between that. Um, we were all to submit before January 9th, so of the applications received, 78.2 units have been requested to be extended. Um, however, staff are only recommending those uh, that the mayor just alluded to. Um, so the 28 units for the two buildings uh, at Twin Chester Meadows, the two units for a townhome in Chesterville. Um, actually, there's four units, two separate semi-detached houses in Chesterville, and then uh, 39.2 units for Wellington in Winchester. Um, there were three other allocation applications requested to be extended. However, they were outside the six-month extension request that Council had originally given uh, direction to staff with regards to that. So, um, I can take any questions Council may have at this point. Thank you for that. Uh, questions, comments? Council Yuri. Yeah, of the two that were uh, accepted or want to move forward in Chesterville, 172 Aaron Avenue and uh, 138 Elizabeth Drive, um, according to the chart that we presented, for 72 Aaron Avenue, it says there was an incomplete building permit application submitted. And then for the 138 Elizabeth Drive, it says no application was submitted. I guess, what does that mean, and why were they selected if there seems to be some deficiencies in their applications? So, if you may, um, the reason they were submitted you know, for council's consideration is because they still have a bill date um, of April 2023, which is in that six month. Um, window. Um, an incomplete building application could mean uh, that they just don't have all of the information submitted properly to the building department. And then you're correct, the other application they do not have um, submitted um, yet. They are also, if you read on there, looking for two additional units at each um, location. The owner is looking to convert that to a set from a semi-detached to a semi-detached with uh, basement apartments in each unit. Uh, so they are waiting the February 7th meeting where council will consider uh, outstanding allocations for that. And that's probably why they haven't submitted it. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? I've all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? The unanimous code. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Moved by Deputy Mayor Brisbane, second by Councilor Annabelle, that Council receive and adopt the accessibility report for the 2022 municipal election. Thank you, Mayor Fraser and Council. Uh, this is one of the last reports that we have to bring forward to Council with regard to the 2022 municipal election. It is a requirement under the Election Act that we get the report for what we've done for disability accepted by Council. Uh, we did have one that was put on the website as part of the candidates package that talked about different things that we did for accessibility. This report goes into a little bit more detail about why e-voting was chosen, why telephones were chosen, and how that um, benefited disabled persons. So that's the difference between the two. So I'm just looking for council's approval and adoption of our municipal. Questions, comments, for the clerk? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, it's carried. Move by Council Annable, second by Deputy Mayor Bergeron, that Council authorize a budget amount of up to $3,950.00 plus HST in the 2023 budget for the purchase of Council Chamber furniture. Madam Clerk. In the summer, we were uh, lucky enough to get the furniture that we see here donated by another municipality. So I was asked to get quotes on what it would cost to finish um, outfitting the rest of the council chambers to give it a more updated and professional look. 
Uh, as you can see, the department heads now are sitting at plastic tables with tablecloths. So I have three options here. It took us a little while to actually find a manufacturer that we could get locally that could match the veneer here, so we have found one. So there are three options that I presented here in the report. One would be to replace the tables that the department heads are sitting at with wooden tables or laminate tables like this, so they wouldn't have the plastic tables with uh, the tablecloths. The second option is to <coughs> excuse me, utilize the stations that council is currently sitting at and the one that I'm currently sitting at as well for department heads to use. And then we would order and have custom-made units to replace the ones that you are currently sitting at now. That's option two. And option three is the same as what I've just discussed, except that where you have two councillors sitting together, you would each have individual units, which would give a little bit more privacy to each of you as councillors. The other thing that's a little bit different is that you would also, the units that would be custom-made also have um, a shelf at the top, so it's a bit of a privacy shelf and whatnot. The one thing that I have not included in the quotes, and it would be extra, is if you look at the picture, there, you can see that little gray thing that has the township logo. That's an additional $358, and that just would drop over where the mayor's bench is. And I, that's a separate add-on we could get, and I haven't included that in these numbers. Well, thank you for all the effort on that, and, uh, and, and thanks for the effort to secure the, what we have, which is uh, uh, quite a step up as, as we move ahead. I, I often notice we use the old council table. It looked like an impromptu press conference with the wires strung about and, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, this, uh, we are moving towards reflecting the seriousness of, of what takes place and the importance of it as opposed to an impromptu press conference. Uh, but anyway, those are my thoughts, and I do thank you for all your efforts, uh, Madam Clerk. Comments, Deputy Mayor. Um, actually, on Monday, after reading this, on Monday when we were at county meetings, I actually looked around there to see what the uh, heads of staff were, were at, and they had they had the same tables as you had in the first picture. Um, because just to, they had just the plain table, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, to Move this furniture, and for us to get new, it's only it's twelve hundred dollars difference, and so I'm okay with that too, depending on what uh, the rest of council thinks. Uh, I personally don't feel that we each have to have a separate. I'm quite comfortable with two of us because that makes a huge difference in cost, and so I'm okay sitting next to John, no problem. <laughs> Yes, I'm sure he, he'd respond in kind. Uh, Councilor Hannibal. I, I would be quite happy with option one. I'm getting quite comfortable where I am, and Matt doesn't seem to mind me, so I'm comfortable with option one. Option one. Yeah, I'm fine with option one as well. I mean, the setup that we have here works for us, and see if we can get some more aesthetically pleasing, let's say, tapes for our department heads, and that's just as well, and I think option one would do that. Okay, so are we going to have to uh, amend this, Madam, Madam Clerk, to reflect option one? You can, and we can leave it at the number that's there, and we'll only spend what we needed for option one. That's your choice. Because it's worded up to. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for uh, straightening out on that. Okay, so option one is, uh, is the majority of council. So all the, uh, any further questions, comments? All those in favor? 
پاوس زندن افتاد
So if they cancel, they lose the fifty dollars. If they go through with it, the fifty dollars goes towards the three hundred and fifty. So it's not like they're out any money at all. And at all these additional charges, as per previous, would be split fifty fifty between us and the marriage officiant. So overall, it's an increase from three hundred to three fifty for the wedding, plus another fifty for rehearsal if they want it, and then the cancellation fee, as I say, is included. Um, the other fee that we were looking on the administrative side to increase is for commission or votes. Because we're so close to Ottawa and some of the other municipalities aren't offering them anymore and the libraries sometimes do, sometimes don't, particularly since COVID, we're only charging $10. So what we wanted to do was implement another fee. Keep it as $10 if you're a resident from North Bandas, but if you're coming from outside of North Bandas and you want our services, we would increase the fee to $20. So it's just a nominal increase there. And the third increase uh, that we were looking at is for burn permits. So I'm going to turn that over to our new liaison to discuss that one. Um, sure. It was brought to our attention from uh, bylaw and planning at our last steering committee meeting uh, presented by uh, Councillor Lennox, our commissioner, that uh, right now we have uh, burn by, uh, permits only $15. And for ag burns, um, one of us, the fire chief, has to go and have do an inspection on it. So for cost recovery, um, they're looking to increase the ag burns permits to $75 to, uh, per property to cover the $50 that it takes for us to go and inspect those calls, or those permits. That's it. That's it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, questions, comments, members of council? I think it's a great idea to have a $50 non-refundable because then you're more certain that the people will actually call it free. Um, I'm okay with, um, let me say the one, the second one. Sorry, what is the second one? Can you say, yes. Um, I can understand what people from outside the region because they're saving money coming here to do it. And so I'm totally agreeable with $20 still is nominal for that service. Um, the raising the fee for the fire burns, I already had one phone call from one farmer. And I think there's a, maybe a misunderstanding where they're thinking that they pay $75 for every burn pile on their property. And I just want to have clarification in public of that $75, what does that cover? And also in another part of that, I don't think, I think $75 is quite reasonable if you have to send a person there to examine the pile. Um, I don't think it's up to the taxpayer base to be paying for an inspection of a pile for a personal property. Um, so on that, um, when we go do it, it's $75 per property, it's not per pile. Um, if a farmer has multiple properties throughout the township, they'll have to buy a permit for each property, whether they have one in the Winchester coverage area, Mountain, Chesterville, Marwood. Um, so it, yes, and the $75 is an annual fee for that property. So again, I talked to you earlier about this, um, working, like I'll call our, their clients to, to me because I've got multiple farmers that I've gone to multiple times for burns. So I, I, I'll have them, I'll go and look at the like, site that they're doing and tell them, like, yes, you're doing it properly. I don't have to keep going back every time. It's a matter of them giving me a call and saying, yes, it's good. Send me a picture carry on, because once they start burning, especially with the big ag burns, once they start, it's it's just continuous. It's almost a continuous burn, so it, it's $75 is an annual fee they get now. I think it's fair. Is there anything further, Deputy Mayor? You all heard the, uh, you all heard the question. All those in favor? Opposed? And then that's good.
Transportation, Mr. T. Moved by Councilor Yuri, second by Council Deputy Mayor Bergeron, that bylaw number 2022-87 being a bylaw to undertake repairs for the South Castle Municipal Drain be read a third and final time in open council, signed and sealed this 18th day of January 2023. Mr. T. Thank you, Mayor Fraser and members of council. Yeah, so the South Castor Municipal Drain uh, drains approximately 45,000 acres. Uh, a tender was awarded for the work uh, for $74,677 by council um, and to be completed in 2023. All property owners upstream from the work will, uh, that's being completed within the watershed will receive a bill. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, under Section 75, um, the drain jack it requires that the bylaw be read at first and second reading, which occurred back in November 8, 2022, at the council meeting. Uh, so this is the third reading of this bylaw. Thank you. Questions, comments, from Mr. Keeney? <coughs> See none. All those in favor? Opposed? None. That's carried. Thank you. Ms. Ward. Moved by Deputy Mayor Bergeron, seconded by Councilor Urig, that bylaw number 2023-04 being a bylaw to establish capital charges for water and sanitary sewer connections in the Township of North Dundas be read in open council, signed and sealed this 18th day of January 2023. Ms. Ward. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So the water and sewer capital charges bylaw update is coming to you because there was a request received in December of 2022 from uh, Winchester's Meadow Development. Um, they are requesting to um, pay the required, they pay oh, about $190,000 worth of capital charges for water and sewer, and they are requesting that they pay that over time instead of upfront. The existing water and sewer capital charges bylaw does not allow us to um, allow for payment over time, so this uh, request is asking council if they would like to amend the bylaw to allow for the payment over time. Specifically in this case, I believe a five-year period. Questions, comments? See none? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's the I'll be quick. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> this isn't specific to just them. This is for yeah. whoever wants to extend over a five-year period. Thank you, Mary. Yes, that's correct. So this, this is an additional section to the bylaw, which would allow anyone, any developer, to apply for this. Um, and then the, the fees and, and the rate of repayment would be at the discretion of council who is separate bylaw. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing them as good. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Mr. Paul. Moved by Deputy Mayor Bergeron, seconded by Council Yerg, that bylaw number 2023-05 being a bylaw to enter into a delayed payment agreement with Winchester Meadows Developments, Inc. for capital charges for water and sanitary sewer connections in the Township of North Dundas be read and passed an open council, signed and sealed this 18th day of January 2023. Mr. Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am the delayed bylaw. Uh, as she was just speaking about, uh, so for the delayed payment, this is a bylaw to enter into the agreement for that. Uh, we had the agreement drafted by the township solicitor. Uh, it's very similar to development charges. Development charges, you can do a delayed payment on development charges over time. Enter an agreement with the municipality, you pay interest uh, over the time. That's not free, you still pay back uh, the municipality with interest. Uh, so this is to enter an agreement with uh, Winchester Meadows to allow this development to go forward. The uh, reason he's asking is to help with this capital financing to put this project in the ground. Uh, it's a great project. It's more of a new one to this municipality, so we'd like to say go ahead and choose to help him make that happen. Good news. Questions, comments from Mr. Paul? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none? Okay. Key information, Mr. Paul. So the next one uh, I'm dealing with here is an introduction of the grading and drainage policy that was enacted with the, uh, through the chief building official, through his policies. Um, right now within subdivisions, you are required to provide a grading and drainage plan for your particular property. It shows that it matches the grading and drainage plan for the entire subdivision, so you don't end up with one house over another one and all the problems in between the houses, making sure everything works. 
Uh, so within existing subdivisions, that's all managed. Uh, where we run into problems is where you get infill lots in between houses. You've got some older houses, older properties in the villages uh, where they split the property in half and then they sell off the, the vacant part. And you don't have any grading drains for that and we get into issues with grading and drainage in this municipality. Uh, for those that have been around long enough, grading and drainage is a big issue. Uh, we are a flat municipality. We don't have big slopes and hills and all the rest, so whenever it rains, you get complaints. Um, and our uh, several employees in this municipality hear those complaints on a regular basis with drainage. Uh, so this policy will require when you do infill lots like that, less than an acre, uh, you would have to provide a drainage, a drainage plan to make sure it works within the neighboring uh, properties. So that basically excludes a lot of properties because anything over uh, a minimum lot size is an acre, so these are within, under an acre. Uh, so anybody that's in the uh, outlying areas would not have to do a grading drainage plan if you're over an acre. You can't really have enough property that's not required. So this applies to that. Uh, we did circulate this policy to uh, several builders, all the basic builders and uh, developers, uh, so they're aware of this policy coming into effect. There is a cost associated with it. You will have to prepare the plan and then make sure that the plan got met at the end of the day. Uh, something like buying a new car. You want to make sure you walk around the car and there's no dents and scratches before you take ownership. Well, this is for the property owner to make sure the drain and, and drainage works, or the and drainage works. Um, we hope to bring a bylaw forward that will spell out a little more detail, uh, so the council have an opportunity to discuss that when that comes forward and any of the, the greater details that where we would require more drain and drainage. This is now really particularly important because we are uh, not able to use site plan control also. Uh, like we used to for three units and over. Uh, now it's ten units and over uh, for site plan control. So we're going to want to look at some of the drainage drains when we get larger developments. Uh, how do you deal with those and making sure the drainage works? Uh, so that's what the law is going to introduce and to protect the municipality from any issues down the road. Uh, these reports that have to be prepared by professionals with liability insurance. The idea is that it's done properly and if there is issues, we have reports to go after them that, yeah, that wasn't designed accordingly. Uh, so that's one of the issues that we're looking at. Um, Councilor Urig had uh, contacted us this week with regard to this policy, uh, based on some information from developer who was concerned about the cost. Uh, we could introduce uh, a few more individuals that would be capable of uh, doing these reports if it's Council's wishes. Uh, that they could be added. Those would be uh, people with environmental tech uh, designations, uh, engineering, uh, engineering training, or a uh, company providing these types of services that has insurance. So that we could add those to the policy if that's what councils wish. Um, but right now they're not in there, so they can be a little more cost effective. Uh, using people like that, or a certified uh, engineering technician can also do these. So, we just to this to the council. And, and <coughs> thank you. Uh, for the presentation, and, uh, and my thanks go to uh, CBL for preparing this and, uh, and coming up with this, the, the, this thought. And I just want, before I open it, and I think I'm sure this comment we had, but before I go there, um, so uh, besides subdivision, with the opportunity with the passing of 23, Bill 23 and the ability to have more units, uh, more residential units on a piece of property, this will also affect that. This, this policy that's being proposed, where those people will have to meet those requirements of the new policy if they want to put extra residential units on their own lot? Yeah, it's an increasing by more than 30% of the floor area uh, on that property than it would be required to. So if you're only doing, building a small addition to accommodate that, no, you would not. But it's a large addition that's consuming more than 30% of the land. Well, I'm thinking, Mr. Paul, that it's, uh, it's extra residents on that property as, uh, as they talk about in the, the cities or towns that have um, post-secondary education facilities, they're, they're looking to put more buildings on properties and, and this, this policy would, would encompass that or capture that? Yes, it would. Thank you. I, I open it up to my fellow counselors for comments. Councilor Yurik. Yeah, no, my thanks to you, Calvin and Jacob, for your response. I, I mean, I completely understand from a township perspective why this is required, although I just, it, it, it strikes me as that uh, uh, Bill 23's passing is more supportive of uh, developers with deeper pockets than there are these small 
smaller developers that we have around here. And, um, while I completely understand, you know, covering uh, from a township perspective and, you know, mitigating any potential losses, liabilities, whatever, I understand that. It does strike me as um, unfortunate and certainly not welcoming of smaller developers that just want to build, you know, residential home and an infill lot and to have something else, uh, you know, tacked on financially when, you know, building permits are already whatever they are and stuff like that, right? So it is a... It's an unfortunate ramification of Bill Clinton's passing and, uh, you know, us trying to keep some level of control when all control seems to have been completely best aside. So if you're looking for uh, any comments on it? No, uh, no but uh, I appreciate it and uh, the Council of thoughts, uh, the, 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 the need to ensure that homeowners uh, won't be flooded out because of, uh, because of the lack of a policy that ensures that the, the drainage is proper. And, and I keep thinking of these three residential units on one lot where there's nowhere for water to go except to the neighbors, unless it's controlled with a plan. So thank you. Would you like uh, the policy amendment to include more people that can do these plans? My thought on that is, you know, to, to the... The challenges the developers are going to have going forward, uh, if we can support them at all with a recommended list or a list uh, that outlines here some opportunities to seek out professionals that can support this, I think that's absolutely necessary. And if I may, Mr. Uh, uh, the other thing we've done too is we've contacted SEMA Plus, who's the township engineer. They are going to produce for us very affordably uh, a sample of what we're looking for so to help the, the builders and the developers know exactly what we're looking for in a plan, basically, to show pre and post uh, what that looks like and to sign off on it. And would that be uh, available to any developer or, or mm -hmm. contractor that comes in with a question and then it can be presented? Here's a sample. These are the things we're looking for. And here's also a list yeah. of the professionals that can achieve that for you. Yeah, I mean, we're really about lists because if you exclude somebody, then they always get annoyed. We, we'll do our best there. Uh, but this will be available online that people can see what we're looking for and take that to somebody and say, can you do that for me? And, and, I, and I understand people being annoyed if they're excluded from the list, but I think the annoyance of people seeking out professionals <laughs> when we have that opportunity yeah. to provide, provide some information. Anything further to this? This is a big change. Okay. Thank you. Good evening again. So at the Newtown Council, we generally present Council with a remuneration bylaw to see if there's any changes that the new Council would like to make. So we circulated the bylaw, uh, the complete bylaw is attached, but I've noted some areas to draw your attention to that uh, you may particularly want to consider. And these, in some cases, are based on uh, questions I've been asked. So Section 1 sets out the rates for Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Councilor. So those can be changed entirely up to you. Section 5 sets out the amount that council is paid for attendance at a convention. It's set at $1,200, and that is meant to, it's a flat rate, you get paid that amount, and it's meant to cover all of your expenses to be there, so your travel, your hotel, your meals. Uh, the township pays for the registration, so that's separate from that. Um, we realize that uh, the GTA, the Greater Toronto Area, hotels are much more expensive, food is much more expensive, so there's a concern whether that is just sufficient and particularly in the Toronto area. Now when we have conferences in uh, Cornwall or Ottawa where generally people are traveling back and forth and they're not renting hotel rooms, the $1,200 may be fine, but it may not be fine in other locations. There's an additional $150 a day that's paid to council members when they attend a conference and that covers up to three days. So that's an amount for you attending in addition to the $1,200. So the three-day conference is $1,650 in total. So I've listed some options if council wants to adjust either of those numbers. You could increase the $1,200 for all conventions to a new number. You could provide a supplemental amount for just 
GTA conventions that you'd recognize that those are higher priced conventions. Or you could go to um, reimbursing based on receipts. A council members submit exactly the receipts, you get back exactly what you had paid out. You could establish a maximum on that if you wanted, it's probably up to you. The other thing you could do is either in addition to or, or you could increase the compensation per day. So those are some options or a council might have a totally different option to deal with the increasing cost of attending conventions. In uh, section 7, there's a clause that indexes the council remuneration to the stats can index for uh, Ontario for the previous year. So for instance, for this year, uh, the annual amount you can see in the chart is 7.14. What we customarily used in the past is December of the previous year to December of the year before. So in this case, December 2021 to December 2022. So the Ontario CPI was 6.0%. In the table below, I pointed out what the amounts would be if we took the amounts that are existing in Section 1, which is the 2022 uh, rates for Council, and we adjusted them by either the 6% or the 7.14%, depending on which indexing you use. And then uh, mileage is the other part. So Section 11 deals with the reimbursement per kilometer. It's set at 50 cents and has been for a very long time, and I'm sure we're all very familiar with uh, the rates of fuel. I know I filled up uh, in between the end of the day and, and uh, was pleasantly surprised by the increases to gas yet again. Um, so certainly we can index that to something that recognizes that fuel costs have definitely gone up. What we've done recently is indexed uh, some of our contractors to the CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency, Amount, which right now is 68 cents per kilometer for the first 5,000 kilometers. Mileage is usually a very small expense here. Where we, we have township vehicles, excuse me, so um, there's not a lot of mileage paid out, but certainly the cost of driving the vehicle has increased. So my intention in presenting to council tonight is to find out if you would like any of those adjusted, and then we will take any suggestions you have, put them in the bylaw, and bring it forward to February 7th meeting so that council can see the, the bylaw. As we all know, Roma Conference is next week in Toronto, so that if there were any changes desired by council, you could consider it a correct to January 1st so that anything would be in effect for the, the conference days next week. Thank you for the presentation, uh, and I will open it up. Uh, some thoughts I have. Um, section 1, um, if that, uh, if Section 1 is the base that we work from, and then if I can just jump to Section 7, I think we should follow my opinion, uh, so look around the table, is that uh, we should be on the, uh, uh, recognized in the same fashion, uh, or treated in the same fashion that staff is with the, uh, that, that, that rate that was established uh, recently with the uh, uh, wage increases, if we could apply that, and then there wouldn't be a discussion, um, a discussion point um, so much. And then the, uh, if I look at section 5, I, I think there's, uh, it needs to be a discussion about recognizing that the hotel rates uh, in the GTA are quite different than uh, what a lot of people understand them to be, and if you had a conference for three days, uh, you would be more than likely use up more money than uh, your allowances is, is, would provide. I think this needs to be, a, 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 in addition to the, to the, to the, uh, the 1200 to the fact that I think other municipalities use a number of $250 to recognize the uh, GTA is a different animal. In saying that, I was recently in Kingston and uh, uh, a hotel room in Kingston where I was is $350 a night. And it's not just strictly the GTA, but the GTA is much more expensive than Kingston, which is much more expensive than Cornwall or Ottawa, I'm sure. So those are two of my thoughts. Um, or a few of my thoughts, I So as I touch base in section one. Um, I think I covered the Oh, the CRA rate for uh, mileage, I, I think that's a reasonable thing. If, uh, I, again, that uh, it, it eliminates it from being supposition to uh, uh, an established number that's used throughout uh, different industries. So those are my thoughts, uh, fellow councillors, and please weigh in. Uh, the mayor have a hand up. Okay, uh, it's true about the GTA. Um, I would like um, 
option two to provide a supplementary amount for the DTA. I know uh, in some places they offer 1500 I don't know if it's something like that in that range for GTA. Uh, section 7, uh, yes, last year we did uh, put the increases for staff between 1 and 3 percent. Last year we waived our, our, we waived ours last year, um, but for this year we'll stay in line, I think we should stay in line with the staff. I, I think it would be horrible to do anything more. And I also agree with uh, to change the mileage to the CIA mileage, and that, that changes every January. So if we just say CRA, then we don't, we don't have to every year say change it to this. Thank you. Councilor Annable. This is going to sound like an echo, but an option, um, section 5, uh, I'd like to, the second option there, um, increasing up conventions held in GTA. Um, I feel guilty even taking the 3%, but I would never, ever take more than what the rest of staff would be offered. That doesn't sit well with me. And the CRA rate of, what was it, 68 cents per kilometer? Is, um, Councilor Newick. Yeah, I'm content with what's been suggested for Section 7 and uh, 11. Um, in terms of Session 5, yeah, I think it's probably beneficial to consider increased costs in terms of the DTA, but to the mayor's point, it's costs are increasing everywhere. <laughs> and I think we might soon discover that. I mean, especially as we get into convention year and we're going to, there's others part of the field. I know what Amos in London, and I would, I would guess that their costs would be largely in line with DTA, given that it's in that corridor. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that uh, there's definitely something to recognize there. Um, and I'd be, I'd be fine with um, uh, number two as well for section five. I guess it's just determining what that supplementary amount might be. Cause it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to ballpark what it's going to cost uh, in Toronto in terms of cost and they continue to climb. Uh, and there's one other thing that uh, I was thinking of uh, with the, uh, the large amount uh, as we book our rooms months in advance, uh, if, if it could be investigated whether or not there's an opportunity to have the corporation uh, pay that amount and claw, essentially claw that amount back from us, just go uh, expensive towards us, and pay that amount going forward and then it's looked after uh, and there's... Uh, the interest charges and everything else, which, which may be uh, a discussion point, uh, that, that disappears and uh, if that can be investigated in that CAO. Certainly. Any problem with that? I have not on that. Yeah. Okay. So if I could just ask for clarification, I heard support for um, providing a GTA supplementary amount. The only one I think that Put a number ways. You must have mentioned the two hundred and fifty dollars. I, I just I, I believe that is those that are putting a supplementary amount to it. That's the number they're using. So that's that's my basis of comment. Okay. So if I prepare that, we'll bring it back. Council can consider. You can change it on February seventh. But that's what will be put there for discussion purposes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I um, ask a question about the consent agenda, do we any directors with comments that they'd like to make before I go through that? Ms. Milberg, please. Good evening, Council. I would just like to inform you of some uh, recent incidents that we have experienced. As uh, so this past weekend, police were called by the public to respond to reported joyriders in the back of the Joel Steele Community Center. 
uh, who were driving up the hill and driving to the city in our backfields. Our team is assessing damages currently and will be seeking restitution. The Recreation and Cultural Department's tractor is also unfortunately stolen over the holiday but was returned. Options are being looked into for greater security for municipal vehicles and equipment. Budgetary prices will be included in the 2023 budget for council consideration. Also over the weekend, the hydraulic hoses on both uh, Arena Olympias uh, failed, but they were replaced on Monday. Um, they were replaced, sorry, replaced on Monday. The Festival Olympia continues to experience operational issues, which cannot be diagnosed. So we have ordered a rental ice resurfacer uh, for the remainder of this season, and it should arrive on Friday or early next week. Thank you. Thank you for the good news. We thank you for the bad news. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <coughs> To the consent agenda, moved by Council Mayor and second by Deputy Mayor Bergeron that Council authorized payments of accounts as per the attached Council report dated December 15, 2022 to December 31, 2022, batch 188 to 196 in the amount of $1,718,712.28 on January 1, 2023 to January 15, 2023. Batch 3 to 11 in the amount of $68,119.54, and that all other items listed under the consent agenda be approved as recommended. All those in favor? Opposed, seeing none as carried. Boards and committees, county kind of council. The deputy mayor and uh, I, we were at the, uh, the county council meeting recently. I lost what day it was, but it was Monday. It was two days ago. Goodness gracious. It seems like it was a week ago. Uh, two days ago, and uh, we, um, we had four presentations, four delegations presented. <coughs> Uh, seeking support and uh, mostly social services, and uh, they will be considered at budget time. Um, Deputy, Deputy Mayor, is there anything else that comes immediately to mind besides the delegations? Uh, ensure that 
Um, we keep advocating for the province to recognize this as something that needs to be much more than just a year-by-year -year thing to make it a permanent fixture. Uh, and it's the Ministry of Health that uh, is to that end of it because it, it's a nurse that's involved. So uh, we need to uh, advocate uh, uh, strongly and, con and continuously until we're successful that this is recognized as something uh, of value to everyone in the province. Big news that's going to take place uh, in, the, in the upcoming year will be the bridge rehabilitation over the South Nation outside of Cheslaw, the overpass. The overpass uh, that diverts traffic around Cheslaw, the bridge there, that is the second largest bridge in SDNG. Uh, it's going to undertake a massive rehabilitation. There will be discussions about the effects that rehabilitation is going to have on the community and uh, uh, vehicle traffic and vehicle traffic that uh, may be diverted. Uh, still, as um, SDG Council is in favor of that, there's more information to come forward, and there will be, I'm, I'm, I'm proposing that there's a public information center uh, set up uh, to uh, bring everyone up to speed locally about this project, because, uh, as I say, the second largest bridge in SDG is going to be affected uh, dramatically. Uh, there, uh, Mr. DeHaan, the Director of Transportation, will be coming to North Dundas Council to bring Council up to speed, all of us, on the uh, scope of the project, and to uh, allow us to have, all of us to have a better understanding of, uh, of the scope of it, and, uh, and then after that, uh, we'll have to figure, uh, schedule a meeting, and I, I propose that that uh, public information center would, would be in Chesterville to bring the, uh, the community up to speed on uh, the challenges that we're all going to face. That's the big one for us. The next item is Ken today. Um, the clerk is organizing, or has asked, to, uh, has asked that a, a meeting be organized between the, the members of the candidate committee so we can have a more fulsome discussion on the future uh, events surrounding Canada Day. The Fire Steering Committee, uh, Councillor Lennox is not here to speak to that. Uh, and the Waterfront. There's no discussion I'm sure about that. Uh, they had a meeting on Monday night at the Gathering House. I wasn't able to you weren't able to attend, in, but they did send me the minutes and told me what went on. Chesel Edition Historical Society. Chesel and District Historical Society. They have another meeting. Mm -hmm. Has anyone attended any meetings? Okay, so we'll skip right through that. Yeah. No, it's just reports on meetings. <laughs> Thank you. Motions, notices, motions. Petitions done. Council comments and concern. I have some comments I'd like to make, and I'd like to. Uh, <coughs> Extend uh, thanks, <coughs> excuse me, congratulations um, to uh, Tom Decker, our facilities manager, and to Brandon Cusino, our program, uh, our program com coordinator. Uh, they both completed the legal awareness level two course. And Danny Villeneuve and Brody Barkley, also from our recreation department, they're two full-time operators, and they completed the basic arena refrigeration course. And these courses are offered through the Ontario Recreation Facilities Association. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Neuberg, if you can extend my thanks and council's thanks to the staff that are here tonight, uh, that we truly appreciate their efforts to ensure that we continue to learn more and more and become better and better at what they do. And, uh, Mr. Decker, thank you very much for uh, your, your efforts. Lena Whitney, the Executive Assistant to the Director of Planning, Building, and Bylaw Services, and the deputy clerk successfully completed the primer on planning course through the Ontario Association of Committees of Adjustment and Consent Authorities. And so my thanks go to, our thanks go to Lena for furthering her knowledge of uh, the things that, uh, in, the, in that department. And uh, those are the comments I have. And any other council comments you can to be expressed? Seeing none.
School Board Deputy Mayor Berzon, second by Councilor Yurig, the bylaw number 2023-03 to adopt and further ratify matters dealt with by resolution, be read and passed in open council, signed and sealed this 18th day of January 2023. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Moved by Deputy Mayor Berzon, second by Councilor Hannibal, that Council adjourn at 8.31 p.m. to the call of the chair. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none, that's carried. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation, and uh, thanks to those that uh, were with us virtually. And until next time, have a good night.